complications in SJA. So as Alexi said, I'm the director of the Rare Lung Diseases Program here, um, which means I see a lot of diseases where I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so the disclosures is I'm a clinical pediatric pulmonologist. I am not a rheumatologist like the last three people you've been hearing from, um, which means they had an hour and a half to talk about their disease, and I get 20 minutes to talk about all of the lung complications that could happen with their disease that even they don't quite understand yet. Um, which makes me not a rheumatologist, a radiologist, nor a pathologist. Um, and I don't sleep at the Holiday Inn Express often enough to consider myself any good at any of those things. And so while I'm experienced in this disease, I do not consider myself an expert. Um, I consider myself the most informed, ignorant person in this disease, because um, I see it. Um, so I guess which brings me to what I think of experts and experience. This is very similar to Dr. Canna's kind of introduction to how we think about ourselves. So, who is an expert in anything? Anyway. So it's someone who's over 100 miles from home with a PowerPoint presentation, right? They stand up in front of you and they're an expert. And considering I'm only 100 yards from my office and my clinical space, even though I have a PowerPoint presentation, I wouldn't consider myself an expert. That makes Dr. Canna the only expert in the room as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, and then what is experience? And how do you get experience? Well, a mentor of mine once told me that you get experience when you're in situations where you wish you had more of it. Um, and so that's what I've been getting a lot of in taking care of your patients, or your children, my patients, your children, um, with this lung disease, is I wish I knew what it, you know, what I do, what I was doing, and that I had more experience in doing it. Um, and we're gaining it relatively rapidly, as Dr. Grom pointed out. Um, we're seeing a number of patients, either fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for us, unfortunately for the community, um, with this interstitial lung disease here in Cincinnati. And they're a combination of local patients, um, patients who were diagnosed somewhere else but then transferred us for care, or second opinions who we see on an intermittent and ongoing basis. Um, and this is, I would like to point out, Alexia, this is the slide before yesterday. There's now an even, it's much, much higher um, after yesterday, thanks to all of you all, um, which are only increasing our experience in this disease so that hopefully someday um, we'll be able to look back and know what we're doing. Um, so the lung complications of SJA generally fall in a very big umbrella sense of the term into three categories. Um, and everyone talks about the last one, the interstitial lung disease. Um, but fortunately, that is still relatively rare in the SJA community as a whole, um, although it is very, very important when it does happen. And so it's very important to remember that there's a lot of other things that happen in the lung in patients with SJA that are much, much more common. Um, mostly being infections. Um, pulmonary hypertension is another rare thing. Um, and then there's this interstitial lung disease. Um, and so what I always tell my fellows and my trainees is, you know, if you're standing around and you hear horse, horses running around behind you, what should you think about? Most people jump to the zebras because they're cool and they're interesting. Um, but in reality, you're more likely to run into a horse. Um, and we even saw this some in the clinic yesterday. So what's probably the most common lung complication in children with SJA have nothing to do with SJA, um, right? So if, you, if your mom has asthma and your dad has asthma and all your brothers and sisters have asthma and you come to my clinic and you're coughing, even if you have SJA, I'm going to say, well, you probably have asthma. And I'm probably going, unless there's other risk factors, right? So it, it's very important to remember the interstitial lung disease and all the other complications. Um, but it's much, much more likely that your child just has asthma, um, and we're going to treat it as such. And if that treatment works, great, we're done. Um, and if that treatment doesn't, then we have to go on and look for other things. Um, it's the same things for if your child, while asleep at night, desaturates. You know, if they're two or three years old and have massive tonsils, I'm going to say, well, you might just have sleep apnea like every other two and three year old who snores and desaturates in my clinic. Um, and that's okay. So we need to make sure not to remember, we need to remember that there are much, much more common things than all the things we tend to talk about. Um, and that these things need to be evaluated for carefully and ruled out um, as you're going along through this process. Um, so to talk about the three big ones, so infections in SJA, obviously with all this immune upregulation, these medicines that downregulate the immune system, um, you're at increased risk for infection. You're at increased risk for what you would consider a typical community-acquired, every child can get kind of infection, although you are probably more susceptible to getting more complications from those infections. But you're also, 
because these immunosuppressive agents become susceptible to atypical infections that are not normally diagnosed in healthy children and are not normally treated and not always treated with typical antibiotics that are used. Um, and so sometimes the rheumatologists refer patients to me for additional testing so that we can test for and potentially find some of these atypical infections so that we can tailor treatments appropriately. Um, and sorry, I just said that part. So, you know, so some, and also sometimes we need to give antibiotics, even the typical antibiotics, for longer if you have a typical infection because your immune system doesn't clear it quite as fast and as readily as you would normally. Um, so pulmonary hypertension is thankfully also a relatively rare complication. Um, and so, under, so just by its name, you know what it is. So it's hypertension, so it's high blood pressure, but it's high blood pressure running through the lungs. So the lungs normally have a very, very low blood pressure, right? Normal blood pressure, as most people know, is somewhere in 100 to 120 over 70 to 90, something like that, or 70 to 80. And in the lungs, though, that blood pressure is usually less than 20. Um, so it's much, much lower than systemic circulation. Um, and because of the inflammation that can occur in the lungs, somewhere around 4% according to that Kimura paper, and we don't have any newer data to understand if it's much more frequent than that, um, develop pulmonary hypertension. And this can occur in association with the lung disease or with the interstitial lung disease, or it can occur in isolation just by itself. And I've seen some very, very severe cases of pulmonary hypertension in patients with systemic JIA. Um, and if you're diagnosed with that, you end up usually being seen by a cardiologist um, who manages pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then there's the interstitial lung disease. Um, so the most important thing I can tell you about the interstitial lung disease is that the term is misleading and nonspecific. Um, so even in our seminal paper in 2013, it was described as a nonspecific term referring to disorders that feature a modeling of the lung interstitium, meaning the tissues of the lung, the distal air spaces, meaning the things way out in the lung, um, with resultant abnormal gas exchange. Um, and it encompasses all of these diseases. It's not, interstitial lung disease is not a disease. It's a big umbrella term for a very big spectrum of disease. Um, as Dr. Grom pointed out, somewhere around 5%, as best we can tell at the moment, of our Cincinnati patients um, develop a form of interstitial lung disease. And I can tell you it's not like anything we've, it's like a lot of things we've seen, but as a total pattern, it's not like anything we've seen. Um, and so we're actually trying at the moment, actively trying to come up with a new name um, to try and describe what this thing, what this is. And so right now we're left to calling it SGIA lung disease. Um, it does have features of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis syndrome, which is a, another bucket of multiple diseases um, that all have similar features under biopsy when you look at them under the slides. And then other features of pulmonary fibrosis, other features of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, a whole host of other diseases that in total make up this SJIA lung disease. Um, but it by itself is not like anything we've seen before. Um, so since most of the patients, so since we spent four hours yesterday talking about that disease um, with the families who have it or are concerned that they might have it, um, and more people don't, so I want to talk more generally about who gets referred to see me um, from our rheumatology clinic so that you know what to look for um, in your own children, um, hope maybe even before your own doctors because this is a new thing. Um, so obviously if your child has fast or difficulty breathing and shortness of breath, that would be a pretty straightforward reason to come see me. Um, chronic cough, so that cough that lingers either when longer than it should after an infection or comes on without infection. Um, recurrent or difficult to treat pneumonias, and this is an important one because we picked up patients with interstitial lung disease this way. Um, it's very tricky, as you all know, to know when your child has an infection because of the periodic fevers that come with the systemic JIA. Um, and so we've had patients who have either mini flares of their JIA or true just runny nose, respiratory tract infections, get chest x-rays, get told they have pneumonia, get treated, and then six weeks later when their kid gets their next runny nose and fever, they get another chest x-ray and they're told they have the same pneumonia and this cycle happens two or three times until they come to see me on a day when they don't have a runny nose and they don't have a fever and guess what, I get a chest x-ray, it looks exactly the same. And we realize that's a chronic problem and not an acute pneumonia. Um, low oxygen saturations would be a pretty simple reason to come see me. And then there's this clubbing, um, which is a physical exam finding that most people in the rheumatology field had heard about but hadn't seen, um, and definitely most parents have never thought about. And this is a very interesting, it's a swelling of the 
the ends of the fingers and toes. Um, and so you can see from the picture that looking at the hand from the top that the very end of the finger gets swollen and is wider than it should. Um, and then what you'll see me do in the clinic, what the doctors do is we look at your hand from the side to try and see if we can see a swelling there. Because there's this natural dip that occurs in the finger right at the cuticle um, naturally. And if you lose that dip, you have this thing called clubbing um, or hypertrophic osteoarthropathy if you want to talk Latin and impress people. Um, and so patients with systemic JAA do not get clubbing um, unless they start having lung disease as best we can tell. I don't think we have a patient with clubbing who has not had lung disease yet. Um, although in such a diverse disease, I expect that exception to the rule to happen someday. Um, and so if you notice this or you notice your child has this, point it out to your doctor and have them come see a pulmonologist. Um, so when you come see me, what happens is we do histories and physicals like everybody else, although I must confess I don't palpate joints and put your joints through all the ranges of motion that your rheumatologists do, and I'm not very good at identifying rashes. Um, we do pulmonary function tests, so we have your child blow into various machines um, to get a sense of how well their lungs work. And then we're looking for low oxygen saturations because the body at rest doesn't need as much oxygen as the body in motion, and so what we do is we put your child in motion. Um, we have great exercise physiologists who run children up and down the hallways um, with pulse oximeters to see if they desaturate. Um, we also do something called overnight pulse oximetry because things always tend to get worse at night and not just because you're trying to sleep and you don't want your child to be screaming. Um, but physiologically, people, patients desaturate more at night than they do during the day, and so it's a very sensitive indicator of resting oxygen saturation. We'll usually get a chest x-ray on pretty much anybody that the rheumatologist see, sends, and then we get echocardiograms to screen for that pulmonary hypertension. And these are relatively non-invasive and simple testing, so pretty much everybody who comes to my clinic with a diagnosis of SJAA and something gets most, if not all, of these tests. But then what do you do? Um, and the answer is it depends. It can be as much as nothing further diagnostically, and we can talk about treatments in a minute. We can do more invasive imaging, which is usually a chest computed tomography scan, otherwise known as CT or CAT scan. Um, we can do flexible bronchoscopy, or we can go as far as doing a lung biopsy. Um, so a chest CT scan gives you better resolution than a chest x-ray. It gives you three-dimensional, um, some three-dimensional sense of what's going on in the lung. Um, it is really fast. Um, the new scanners only take 0.35 seconds to do a CT scan, and it's a modest radiation dose. It's more than a chest x-ray, which is why we don't just do them on everybody. Um, but it's not as high as it used to be, and so the risks of cancer and radiation toxicity are much, much lower um, than most people would think. Um, and it allows you to see things. Wrong button. Um, oh, sweet, this works. Uh, so this is a CT scan of one of my SJA patients, or one of our SJA patients. Um, and what you can see is you can see this big gray thing in the middle is the heart, which my cardiologists tell you is important. And you've got a right lung and a left lung, because in medicine we like to flip things around backwards so that nobody can read our studies but us. And the lungs are mostly full of gas, and so they're black and empty, or at least that's the way they're supposed to be. And you can see airways and blood vessels and all kinds of level of detail. You can see little airways and little blood vessels. And then you can see things that you may not see on a chest CT, which is this little gray area right there, and that little gray area right there. Um, and those are not supposed to be there. Um, and that's where this child's interstitial lung disease was hiding. Um, but it gives us a chance to see a better idea of how much of the lung is, in fact, is impacted by whatever disease we're looking for and where is it. Because if we want to go to a lung biopsy or a bronchoscopy or some other invasive testing, we want to make sure we look in the right place because the lung is a big place and we could miss something if we don't go to the right spot. Um, there is a... So we like CT... So obviously you're breathing during most of your life. And so you want to... And if you're moving during a picture, the picture gets blurry. And so ideally we have you, if you're old enough, we have you hold your breath so that you stop moving while we do a chest CT scan. 
Um, the children who develop these interstitial lung diseases are really young. They don't hold their breath. They don't listen to much things. And so then we have to figure out what we're going to do next. And so there is sometimes indication to sedate the children for this test um, so that we can control their breathing and make them take breaths, take big breaths, take small breaths on command because um, we're helping them breathe and get better images. Um, we here in Cincinnati frequently do these scans not sedated, which makes us, means we lose some of this fancy resolution, but we can usually see what we need to see. Um, so that's a conversation for you to have with your local doctors on how their chest CT protocols are done for small children. Um, flexible bronchoscopy is something we do here on a very, very routine basis, probably more so than any other pediatric hospital in the world. And in this, the patient has to be put to sleep. I guess they don't have to be put to sleep, but the patient wants to be put to sleep, so they're put to sleep. Um, it's a same-day outpatient procedure. You come in the morning, you don't eat after midnight, kinds of things, and then you go home the same day. Um, we have fiber optic scopes, the smallest of which we use for SJA is 2.8 millimeters, and I've got one up to 4.6 millimeters in size for bigger children. Um, and we either put it through the nose or through a breathing tube in the mouth, down through the trachea and down into the lungs. And this allows me to see directly the main big airways of the lungs. Um, and it, but importantly for SJIA, it allows me to do something called bronchoalveolar lavage. And what this is, is we squirt in a relatively small amount of saline or salt water that's sterile. And then we, and that saline or salt water goes and fills the lung all the way out past where my scope, doesn't fill the whole lung, but just fills the small part of the lung that I'm working in out to the end. And then I suction most of that back out. And that picks up all the mucus, debris, um, bacteria or fungus if we're trying to rule out infection. It also picks up the cells, so those alveolar macrophages and other things, and collects them into a little cup for us to go analyze. Um, it also will pick up all those fancy cytokines and interleukins and all the things the rheumatologist talked about um, if, they can, if they're in the lung and can be measured in the lung. Um, so it's a very useful tool. Um, but doesn't really allow us to see those pretty pictures that Dr. Grom showed you at the end of his talk. In order to get those pictures and to get those tissues, we have to resort to a lung biopsy. Um, and in small children in this kind of disease, the only way to do that properly um, is through a, f a full traditional surgery. Um, and there's two ways to do it. The way on the right is called an open thoracotomy, which is pretty straightforward. You go in there all the way. And then the way on the left is a, something called a VATS procedure, which is a video-assisted thoracopic surgery. Um, it's the same thing as laparoscopic surgery in the abdomen, only it's done in the thorax, so it has a slightly different acronym called VATS. Um, after the surgery, you do have a chest tube postoperatively, and you will spend at least two to three days in the hospital recovering as the lungs heal and the chest tube is pulled. pulled. Um, but for us, we get a whole tissue specimen. We can actually see all the anatomy um, and pathology of what's going on inside the lung to better understand the disease process and hopefully change treatment regimens as appropriate. Um, so what do we do after that? So it's, again, just like the evaluation, the treatment and follow-up is also extremely variable and very specific to whatever situation we're in and whatever suspected or confirmed diagnosis we're working with. Um, and so the options are we watch and we wait and just do supportive care, um, which I've done on many a time because I either don't know what to do or it's not very clear what we do. Um, or fortunately, we don't think anything's going on at the moment. The other option, say if you have a child who you think have, has asthma, you do some testing and then you start some treatment option for asthma and you wait and see if it works. And if it works, you say, great, that's probably what it was and we stop. But if it doesn't work, then you have to reconsider your first hypothesis and move on and do other testing later. And then there are other patients who, as soon as they hit the clinic, were worried, and we move very quickly to a very aggressive workup and treatment plan. Um, so where are we trying to go? Well, the first thing we're trying to do is now that we know this disease exists and what it sort of looks like, because we're trying to educate patients and physicians about this risk of lung complications so they know it when they see it um, and know, even if they don't know what to do, they know to call somebody who does um, so that we can work through it. Um, the other option... But the other thing we're working on is to determine the risk factors um, of who gets this disease um, and what are the causes of these lung complications because ultimately we want to prevent it. 
Um, I know everyone keeps asking me about treating it, but my first pre preference would be to prevent it from ever happening. Um, but since it does seem to be happening at the moment, the next step is to figure out what it is, what's causing it, um, so that we can treat, treat it and make it go away. Um, so I work with a very big team. Um, I do not do this in a vacuum. I have a, a wonderful nurse and administrative assistant who do most of the heavy lifting for me. Um, I have a big pulmonary division who supports me and makes me look a lot smarter than I am. I've got radiologists and pathologists. Um, I've got a wonderful surgeon. We have a great group of rheumatologists here. And then, of course, we have all of you um, who come to see me and entrust me with your, chi you trust me with your child's care um, and giving me the experience so that hopefully we can figure this out together. And so we'll take any questions. Since this is family day, there's mine. Um, there's Eleanor on the left and Atlas on the right. And with that, I'll take any questions. With the uh, increase recently in the lung involvement with SJIA, is this environmental SJIA, or is there not enough research yet? I'm going to give Dr. Canna's answer. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> the, I mean, the short, we don't know. It's, mm -hmm. it, there's not enough research yet. Um, there's, you know, Dr. Grom and the amyloidosis story suggests that there may be in, you know, in the fact that it was there in Europe for a while and then it went away, mm -hmm. even though the patient population never changed and the treatments never changed, suggests that there may be an environmental factor that's triggering this. Um, there's obviously the question of the biologics and the treatments that could be triggering this. Um, and so the short answer is we don't know. All right, thank you. Hi. So. Um, probably frustrating to get a lot of questions from people who aren't doctors that have great ideas for you. But um, so if we don't know what's causing it, and I'll just give my own example that the only reason I know we have interstitial lung disease is because we of this foundation and the fact that I came and learned about it and then got a CT scan and there it was, right? So no symptoms. Um, so if we are working to prevent it, or mm -hmm. even if we're working to cure it, wouldn't it be helpful to know sort of when it starts in patients, right? And so what is the risk benefit of giving anyone with um, what we're calling persistent SJIA? Specifically, we know that MAS plays a role, I think, with the um, lung complications to giving them a CT scan at some point in the process that you guys decide whether they show any symptoms or not. Because what it could show is a bunch of people who don't have lung disease, right? Mm -hmm. And then we know, okay, they have, you know, refractory MAS, but they have no lung disease. But at a point, if we screen them every year, and I know there's radiation involved, we would see at what point they are getting the lung disease, and that might help inform where it's coming from. And then we could sort of, you know, analyze that with what medications they're taking mm -hmm. and all those points of data. So what is the current thinking from this group, I guess, on when we should start screening these children for lung disease, given that they don't necessarily present with the symptoms first? No, that's an excellent question and a question we've been asking ourselves and so one where we have already started implementing um, within our rheumatology group. So what we are or what our current standard of care here in Cincinnati is, is that every child with SJIA at the time of diagnosis of the SJIA, whether they've got macrophage activation syndrome or not, um, will get a chest x-ray and will get the pulmonary function testing that I described based on their age, um, including the overnight oximetry study, the six-minute walk test, and whatever pulmonary function testing we can get based on their age. And so we're going to get that on every child at the time of diagnosis of SJIA. We're going to get that again on every child annually. And we're going to get that on every child at the time, probably not at the time, but maybe four to six weeks after any episode of macrophage activation syndrome. Um, and so we are going to start macrophage activation syndrome, pneumonia, or any other funny cough or inkling that the rheumatologist have that something may be going on. Um, so we are starting that screening protocol. The, right now, and that's clinical. We haven't yet taken the step of the chest CT scan because it is 
the risk benefits of that are less clear in the sense that we know there's a very, very small but non-zero risk of doing chest CT scans and there is potential benefit. I think we need more inform and so we didn't think we could get clinical buy-in from all rheumatologists to get a chest CT scan at all those intervals that we just described on every child. Um, and so the way the algorithm works is that that's, those are the things we recommend as a minimum on any child, on every child. And if there's any, any inkling of concern on any of those tests or the hairs on the back of Dr. Grom's neck stand up for any reason whatsoever, then we get a chest CT scan. So there's a very, very low threshold for doing it. Um, but we're not quite ready to make the leap to recommend it for every child at this point. Um, that's one reason why we're looking at the MRI technology um, because there's much, much less risk associated with that, almost zero, relative to the CT scan, and that would be a test we'd feel more comfortable recommending at all those intervals um, because of that lower risk. And how do you proliferate that protocol out to the other rheumatologists across the country and across the world? So, you know, the systemic JA uh, foundation is connect the dots. I feel like that's great that you're doing it here and for all of us here in the room that are hearing it, but there's so many more mm -hmm. out there, the Facebook page of 100, you know, people that are participating. Is that through the CARA registry? I mean, how is that story being told to all the other rheumatologists out there? So, um, so the, the honest answer is we just started doing that within the last three to six months, so we haven't had a chance to do part two yet, but part two is up to Dr. Grom, Dr. Schulert, and Dr. Bruner, who is going to answer the question. <laughs> Uh, well, my name is Semina Bruna. I'm the division director in rheumatology here. Uh, what we have started, supported by the hospital, to do uh, have a structured approach to systemic juvenile arthritis, realizing that the disease is somewhat different than the other JAA patients we are treating and the other rheumatology patients we are seeing. So what we do do is uh, we try to, is, well, we are, our attempt over the next three years is to come up with a logical and evidence-based approach to screen for children with lung disease and to make the diagnosis of systemic JAA early. Because if you don't make the diagnosis of systemic JAA, then finding the lung disease will not happen. So a couple of steps in between, we are, there are lots of tests one one can do, but in really in order to educate others in the, uh, in the community, we need to say, well, this, this, and this test is the best one. Not everybody is in a large tertiary center. So in some centers, we may only have access, you know, there may not even be a pediatric pulmonologist with experience in it. So we want to make sure that the three or four tests we're proposing have a very li high likelihood to identify children who are at risk for the disease or have an early, you know, feature of the disease so that we then can do the CTs and follow them and make sure they get the best possible treatment and that we are just therapists thereafter. First we need to recognize and we really need to make sure that we know what we are doing. I think the worst thing is to spread some myths and just, you know, myths that are not evidence-based or really can cause harm. Give you examples. In the 1950s, Dr. L you know, we all, uh, pediatric rheumatologists gave a medication called penicillamine, like vitamins to everybody. Turns out after 15 years, children had side effects from it. It had no effect on the disease whatsoever. So basically those myths that are kind of spread without evidence is, can do harm. So how do we spread that to other places? We spread it by in a publishing high level scientific evidence in peer-reviewed manuscript. Uh, you know, personal, per, uh, like, pearls from physicians are good, but we need to have the data behind it. Realizing there are kids who are living here and we need to act now, we start experiments, but, you know, spreading it to others, we need to be careful to make sure that we know what we are saying. Thanks, Dr. Bruner. To follow that up, I'm Essie Morgan. I'm one of the rheumatologists here as well. And um, we have an organization called PR Coin, Pediatric Rheumatology Care and Outcomes Improvement Network. Um, I spoke about that a little bit at the last meeting. Um, but once we have clear evidence, so what Dr. Bruner said makes a lot of sense. We need to know that this is the best practice before we can say, hey, everybody do this, because there may be harms first do no harm, but once we know, then we try and get people to adopt this and implement these best practices. So PR Coin is a learning network, and we're focused on quality of care at different hospitals. We have 18 hospitals that participate. Once we have a quality standard, we measure how well people are implementing that. 
So we talk about a bundle of things that people should do given a certain diagnosis and then measure whether people are doing it. And then we look at the hospitals who are performing the best and learn their best practices and share that with everybody. We're not competing, we're trying to share best practices so that all the patients get the best care. If, if, if I may just add, there's a bunch of, this comes up in the group all the time, you know, especially for parents who have had some of the risk factors for lung disease and they are concerned about it. And they have a very tough time getting the centers to do some kind of a x-ray or CT or something to even like, you know, start with an x-ray to understand if there's anything going on. Um, I, would, I would be curious from the parents who are in the room who do not have lung disease, if they would be willing for their child to undergo x-ray or CT to find out if there is, uh, if, if there is any, anything going on in the lungs. And first, raise your hands if you don't have lung disease so that we get a sense of how many parents are there in the room. Okay, and now, Keep your hands up if you would be okay with going in for some kind of screening. So just, just so that you have some parent input here, this is an issue that's been discussed many times in the group. Yes. So my son was diagnosed four years ago, and they have been having us do annual um, pulmonary function tests. What should we be looking for in those tests that would change? So, it, I mean, it depends on what the pulmonary function test is, but the, yeah, yeah. So, I would say that at this point, since we're still in the early stages of it, I can't tell you that, because so there's lots of parameters we measure in pulmonary function testing, and so I can't tell you which one of those parameters is the, is the parameter yet, because um, as like Dr. Bruner said, at the moment we're going to look at all of them and try and figure out which one that is. What I would say is any, if there is any significant change in, in the lungs and how they're functioning. Um, and so there are, there are accepted standards for what a significant change is in all of those pulmonary function parameters. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a change from normal to abnormal to be considered significant. So, um, so for example, so normal in pulmonary function testing like in all forms of testing is 100% of what you think should happen, right? So if you're exactly 100% of normal, of, of what the predicted equations say, you're normal. However, there's also a range of normal, right? There's a normal height for people, but some people are 5'6", and some are 6'6", and both of those are considered normal. And so it's the same in pulmonary function testing. And so in pulmonary function testing, the normal, normal is 100%, but the range of normal is generally between 80 and 120%. So there's a range of that. And so anybody who blows pulmonary function testing in, of a 70% or 75%, everybody would say that's not normal, that's a problem. But I would argue that each child is relatively stable in and of themselves. And so if your child blows 95%, that's normal. And if the next year they blow 95%, that's normal. And then if the next year they blow 84%, that's not normal. Even though it hasn't fallen outside the normal range, for your child, the number has dropped. And so, at least at that point, the question needs to be asked, what is going on? Doesn't necessarily mean your child has anything bad or, you know, wrong with them. If you do a pulmonary function test a week after a cold, you're going to have an abnormal result relative to your normal because you're not in a normal state at that moment. So you've got to always take the context of what's happening but at least that's when I would start asking the question of, is there a problem, you know, and at least, and get some follow-up on it, either by seeing a pulmonologist or simply just repeating the test a month later to see if that's, the change is consistent. If that change is consistent, then that may prompt you to do further testing. Does that answer your question? There's also changes for growth, too. Correct. And so that, so the, so you are right. So the, the equations we use are corrected or account for the child's age, um, their race, their gender, and their height. Um, and so as your child grows, the equations of what we expect your child to do should change with your child, and your lungs should grow accordingly. And so, that's, and that, and so that, 
the target of 100% changes from year to year. Um, and so if your child's blowing 95, 90, you know, and so that's why I wouldn't get too hung up on little changes because the equations aren't perfect. Um, but any change greater than 10% is, should at least prompt the question of whether or not we need to look further into it. So if we're listening for, if we're watching for a cough, mm -hmm. um, are we listening for a wet cough, a dry cough, like a, you know, consistently every day coughing fits or just what, what are we, coughing is broad. <laughs> coughing is very broad. Um, so, and the short answer is it could be any of those. Um, and so it's, it's whatever, whatever constitutes a change for your child, I would say is significant. And dry coughs can be significant for lung disease or wet coughs can be significant for infection. So I wouldn't limit it to one versus the other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yes, so children this age, as you know, get runny noses every once a month on average. Um, the aver so this is all speaking in generalities, right? And so you've all gone to your pediatrician, and they've probably given you the exact same speech, right? Where you go and they say that the cough will last for three to five days and then it will start getting better. So, what I would, so the, the coughs to me that are concerning and are definitely concerning are coughs that stay bad for more than two weeks. And coughs, coughs should last from a single illness for up to a week to two and be bad. And that would be, to me, within the normal enough range that I wouldn't get super excited yet. And then they slowly get better. Um, so you can cough for up to a month following an illness. But after the first week or two, that cough should be showing something of getting better. It should be happening less frequently during the day, should be less intense, and should get better. But you may still, you know, you should stop coughing when you're just sitting there, but maybe you still cough when you move or something along those lines. So, and, and, you've, and you've all seen these illnesses in your children where they get really sick and they cough. And even three weeks later, they're still coughing more than they normally do, but hopefully you're seeing some evidence of improvement. Um, so I would say any cough that doesn't change over two weeks, um, and especially any cough that lasts at a significant um, level for four weeks or longer would be considered abnormal, whatever, whatever the cough looks like or acts like. Thank you so much. Hmm? We'll, we'll break for lunch now.